Hello, I'm Simon. Welcome to my workshop. In this video, slightly different from my previous videos, so feel free to skip it if it's not your thing, I'm going to be unboxing and assembling the Mesu E200 telescope mount. Let's get tinkering. The Mesu E200 Mark II telescope mount comes in a number of packages that I collected from Modern Astronomy. The box contains the main mount, which I believe needs to be bolted together. Then there is the SciTech hand controller, a USB to serial cable, some knobs, some other cables, a power cable that needs wiring up. And we've got the base plate here, the counterweight box and the saddle plate where the telescope goes and then the counterweight bar. First thing to do is to um, read the instructions on unpacking and to begin assembling the telescope mount. I should point out straight away that this is a record of how I assembled the mount, following the instructions I was given. These mounts are constantly evolving, so if you have one and have stumbled across this video, please check your instructions before following what I did. One of the things the instructions impress on you is that the servos which move the mount are fragile, so you should avoid touching them. I was very conscious of this throughout, so was careful to make sure they were never taking any weight. The Mesu mount is what astronomers call a German equatorial mount. This type of mount can track the stars and forms a T shape. On the Mesu mount the two axes are connected together by the counterweight box. And this is what I am currently fitting. This is very much a premium mount built for the advanced amateur astronomer or university and the quality is very evident. I really get the sense that this has been lovingly made in an engineering workshop by skilled engineers. And it is clear from the build quality that real care has been taken making the mount. The assembly instructions are very good. They are in clear, easy to understand English and point out any particular care or cautions you should take during assembly. The circular black part is the interface between the mount and the Mesu pier. This needs to be solid to ensure there's no flex when the mount is moving the telescope, which could be up to 16 stone or 100 kilograms, so it's made of very thick steel. Now you can see the form of the German equatorial mount taking shape. Unlike most mounts, the Mesu uses a friction drive, so there are no gears to cause backlash. This is important on any mount because backlash results in inaccuracies in pointing and guiding the telescope. Another important feature of any mount is how well it tracks the stars across the sky. With an ideal mount the stars stay solidly on the same pixel for long exposures, even without a guiding system providing feedback. The Mesu mount addresses this by using friction drives rather than worm gears. The way I think of this is that for the same skill level an engineer can make a much more accurate friction drive than they could make a worm gear and so you simply get higher tolerances for your money. Then to support these tight tolerances the mount is fitted with rotary encoders with 16 million ticks per revolution so it always knows where it is to a high degree of accuracy. The mount weighs about 17 kilograms and is bolted to the pier Currently the pier is sitting on the wooden floor of the observatory. This is only temporary. I will wait for a clear night and polar align the mount. This is to say I'll accurately align the RA axis of the mount so that it is parallel with the Earth's rotational axis. The only thing left is to assemble the counterweight bar. This bar will hold the weights that will be used to balance the telescope. Even this bar is awesome. It's made from thick stainless steel tube and has been engineered so that it can't fall out even if the fixings were not tight. It just oozes quality workmanship. 
Now, many astronomers can recount the times when their cables on the telescope became snagged and ruined, an image or worse broke something. The Messu mount has a cable management system built in that significantly reduces the chances of this happening. So I'm threading the hand controller cable through these holes and up to the control box. Then having fitted the telescope and balanced it with the counterweights, I was ready for the first test, seeing if my computer could control it. Now all I needed to do was wait for a clear night to do a rough polar alignment on the mount. Last night I polar aligned the pier by moving and rotating the legs to the right position. It's within a couple of arc minutes of the pole now so I know that the positions that the legs are in on the floor um, are where the concrete pads need to go. So my next job is to mark the floor then cut holes out and put some concrete pads in underneath going to the foundations. While I've got the telescope off I thought I'd show you the extent of the wiring. I've basically got a power cable and a USB 3 cable and they go through the mount, quite a large hole here you can actually get your hand in which is quite nice and they go down through a hole in this piece through here and into the pier and they follow the pier down and come out there's also another power cable that goes into the pier comes up here it comes out at the side here and goes into the controller just there so there's only three cables going up power for this one power for the uh, the controller basically my little 12 volt powered hub which sits on the telescope and powers all the equipment and my USB 3 which goes to a USB 3 hub on the telescope and um, connects all the equipment to the computer marked the holes that I need to cut in the floorboards. Some of these go through joists so I'm going to have to shore it all up and I obviously need to fill in the hole where the previous pier went. Many friends swear by the usefulness of an oscillating multi-tool and this was the perfect job to try one on. I opted for a corded version because I didn't think I would use it as often as my friends seemed to think I would. And it's quite an investment to buy into a battery system just for a multi-tool. Had I known that less than a week later my corded hammer drill was going to break, I would have gone for the cordless version and got a powerful percussion drill at the same time, justifying my investment. But that's life I guess. I'll do an overview of this tool in a future video. The multi-tool makes short work of preparing the holes in the floor and using some scrap MDF I cut out shuttering on the bandsaw. So I've repaired the floor and put the three concrete pads in. I now need to leave them for probably a week to dry that wet patch on the floor over there in the top middle is from a leak in the roof and I think I've fixed that it's difficult to say till it pours hard again this is my first test image I left the mount unguided which means that there was no feedback to the mount to nudge the telescope if the tracking was slightly out the thing to note is how round the stars are. Any issues with polar alignment or the native tracking capability of the mount will show up as oval stars. So I'm really happy with how round they are. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd just like to point out you don't need to spend thousands of pounds on a mount to enjoy astronomy. But as with any hobby, the more advanced you become, the more exacting your requirements are. 
and those exacting requirements tend to cost more money. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a thumbs up, and if you've got any comments or questions, then please leave them below, and I'll see you in my next video. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, why not subscribe by clicking my logo? It's free, and YouTube will add some of my videos to your feed. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you soon.